Welcome to the Prime Venture Partners Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Amit Somani, and I am delighted to have with us again in a different format, uh, Anshumani Rudra, a friend, a product tinkerer, and the product lead for Google Pay globally. Uh, welcome to the show, Anshumani. Good to be here, Amit. Really good to be here. So, Anshumani, you had a lot of varied careers, including sort of landing up at Google, uh, kind of the mother of them all. And I used to be at Google many years ago. So we'll talk about Google in a second. But maybe you can take our listeners through your early journey from, you know, the Zynga days to QMath and so forth in terms of your own evolution as a product manager, product designer, product strategist. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so at Zynga, I started out as a game designer. So I was the first uh, game designer at Zynga India uh, and, you know, was part of the core team, which originally sort of Set, set around to sort of building out Zynga India, the first studio of Zynga outside the US, right? Uh, and we did phenomenally well. It grew incredibly fast. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in the US working with PMs and designers there. Um, and I think sort of the, the, the product design bug uh, uh, sort of bit me then. You know, this was Zynga in its early days. Uh, Pre-IPO, Zynga was, was a phenomenal place. Uh, to work, it, it still is, it, it still continues to do phenomenally well. But back then, just the concentration of PMs and game designers was, was, was amazing. And I think that started this journey for me, which I continued by running my own game studio, uh, Tiny Mobile Games, which eventually got acquired by Hike. It was a sister company to Hike. Uh, and then I, I sort of reached a decision point where I was like, okay, I've spent enough time in games. Uh, let me see if I can sort of take the lessons from, and at, at this point, officially, I'd never held the product manager title. I had been a game designer and then a general manager or sort of a studio head, right? Uh, but my thesis was that the, you know, there are a whole bunch of learnings from the world of uh, game design and the, from the world of gaming, which can be applied to what I call the Roti Kapra Makan products, right? Like uh, regular everyday use products, which, which millions of people use. So I, I found the thing which was diametrically opposite to uh, entertainment. Uh, which in my head seemed like healthcare and education. So I, I went to Practo, uh, right, to see if that would make sense. And uh, great experience. So again, so sort of spent time at Practo running sort of the, you know, the, the central product or their, uh, both the consumer side product as well as the, uh, the doctor facing products. Uh, then uh, went to my first love, which is education. Uh, I come from a family of educators, so sort of education uh, runs fairly deep in the family. So went to QMath uh, to head product there, uh, build out a team, uh, very different business model, very different scale. You know, when you're in the world of games, you know, there are millions and millions of users who, who play your games. And here, you know, we were doing a very B2B2C model you know, thousands of teachers teaching tens of thousands of students. So very, very different model, very uh, different scale and, and, and a very different set of problems to be solved. Uh, and after that, uh, I worked at Hotstar, which, which now is Disney plus Hotstar. So I, I was there for a very long time, uh, led sports, social and gaming verticals at Hotstar and sort of was responsible for, uh, you know, our streaming of IPL and World Cup and a bunch of other things. So, you know, Hotstar is the home for cricket, uh, in India. So, so I did a bunch of that. Um, and uh, then very recently, it, it, it's, it's been nine months and uh, I, I've been at Google. I, I thought everyone and their grandmother was working in fintech. So I thought, hey, about time I also went and tried out fintech. Uh, I mean, jokes aside though, it was, it was also sort of uh, the fact that, you know, Google is a generational company and part of me felt that, hey, someday I'm going to be 60. And I'd look back at my career and say, damn, I didn't work at Google. So let me, you know, now seems to be a good time to go uh, work at Google. And Google Pay is, is definitely like a, like a having spent so much time at startups, both early stage, mid stage and late stage, Google Pay seemed like a startup within Google and it is a startup within Google, uh, definitely has the culture. So, which is how I ended up there. Fantastic, um, lot, lots of different threads to follow up on. Let me break it down into two. Hmm. One is your own journey going from being a game designer to a general manager, to a product manager, to running your own studio as an entrepreneur and so forth. So, you know, in what, what are the skills that you've learned that sort of, you know, helped you across, right? And, and in terms of cross-pollination to the, to the extent that if somebody was a general manager today or a manager or an engineer, wanting to go the other route, become a game designer or become a this, you know, how, how versatile, you know, is that sort of path of learning? That is one thread. 
And the other thread, maybe I'll, I'll pause here, but is really the multiple different verticals you worked in, right? So mm -hmm. let's let's do that later. Yeah, yeah. On the first one, I think so. I, I essentially, I I feel like a lot of product building is you know it requires this sort of cross pollination where uh, you know being a, a jack of all trades and master of none. I think it's an over abused term, but if you really think about it, what it requires is breadth more than depth in a lot of areas. I think you need depth in one or two areas, but you need a lot more breadth uh, because a part of being a product builder, a part of being a product manager, a successful product manager at least, is being able to work with other people. So I think one of the big things there is that do you have a deep appreciation for what engineers do on a day in and day out basis? What do uh, you know designers do on a day in and day out basis? The, the kind of work that uh, marketeers do and uh, you know folks on partnerships and business development do. And I think that bit of just sort of being the glue that holds the team together and being able to work in this cross-functional way, I think it requires you to have enough breadth that when you sit in a room with people very different from you, who, who do a very different function from you, are you able to listen, absorb, make sense of what they are telling you, and then contribute in a positive way? And I think, uh, to me, I think, when people talk about a breadth of skills, I think to me, that is sort of the, 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 the theme, the motif, so to say, which runs across all these things that, you know, are you able to go and contribute uh, within these different tools? I, am, I never diminish the sort of the ability for people to be subject matter experts in a particular domain or sort of just have insane depth because without those people, you don't get things built, right? But those are people you bank on Right. So like, you know, the, the, the 10x engineer or sort of the, those phenomenal designers and engineers, you need them to build great products. But there is a there is a great utility for people who can just go across different functions and and again, sort of do all the three levels right off of this job function. You know, and I, I sort of have this, you know, the Simon Sinek start with the why framework always sort of seems very applicable to me when it comes to product managers job, right, which is the why, how, and what. Why are we doing what we are doing? And why would people care if we did this? Why would our users care if we did this? And to me, that's actually strategy. So that's the first layer. Why right. build this? Why do this? Why should I be doing this? Why should we collectively be building this, right? And that sort of is the strategic part of any function, but I think very critical for product managers. The second bit is, how should we build this? How should we go about solving this problem, which is very clearly the domain of tactics. And then there's the bottom layer, which is what? What should we be doing, right? What should be the steps that we take? And I think that's very clearly in the realm of execution. Now, if we take a sort of a diagonal line through this or create a wedge through this, like a pyramidical wedge, right? Execution is obviously critical. When we start off in our careers, you know, we have to be very good at executing. And then over time, we become better at tactics and hopefully at some point become really good with strategy. But to be able to function in this very cross-functional way and be able to sort of go across this, especially in a startup environment, I think all three things are required. So again, it's sort of more breadth versus depth. You're a great phenomenal strategic thinker. You have a role in the startup world, but there is a limitation to what you'd be able to do if you can't execute and you can't come up with tactics. Similarly, you're great. You're a, you're a machine. You're a beast in execution, but you don't, you don't have strategic depth or you don't have tactical depth, you will struggle. So I think, which is where as PMs, you know, having all these three abilities is great. So again, it's more of breadth as opposed to sort of depth. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm also a big fan of this work, right? Uh, just like Simon Sinek uh, of David Epstein, right? How generalists yes, succeed in a specialized world. Absolutely. And it's really, you know, multidisciplinary thinking and applying it in various ways. To make it more practical to many of our listeners who might be sort of early stage entrepreneurs, if you are going and hiring product managers or product strategists or designers, you obviously are not going to get everything in every person, right? And you're also mm -hmm. typically, when you're starting out your company, yeah. you don't have the war chest that the Google has to, to hire on Shivani Rutra, right? So how would you, you know, would you prioritize in the early days of the company, like think zero to one, one to 10 stages, certain skill sets over the others in terms of the, you know, the why, the how, and the what? If, so I think it, it has to be a very deeper analysis of who you are, 
so, so if if i was the founder of this company right and i had i had say two co-founders if between the three of us i knew what our skill sets were very very clearly then i need to hire people who complement those skill sets and and maybe cover the skill sets which are not present right so if you are a product co-founder right like if i was the co-founder i wouldn't worry too much about at least in the early days the the strategic and tactical side of things i would get people i i would get great designers on board who have sort of very good sense of ux thinking but i would get really good executors on board right so i would go after young people who who can just be you know beasts when it comes to execution right uh, and put in the hard work and it's not necessarily work 16 hours a day but when they work in that focused 8 10 hours they can move mountains right similarly if if you know if if one of the co-founders is a very strong sort of cto himself or herself then go hire engineers who are sort of going to help uh, help in sort of execution. But if you don't have an engineering counterpart, then I think uh, forget the job title, but essentially hiring an architect, right, is is job number one. Get someone in who 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 can build the shape of the in the vision that you have. Who can actually translate sort of what you want to build into this sort of framework saying, Hey, these are the APIs we'll build. This is a structure that we'll build. This is, this is the platform that we'll build. And, you know, these are the pieces that we'll build. And then they can go and work either with external engineers or build sort of a small team of front end and back end and sort of full stack engineers within their house. Right. Again, if you're a founder and design comes naturally to you and good user experience, forget like being able to use Figma, but if you have a good yeah. sense of user experience, then you go hire designers who can help translate your vision into reality. But if you don't have a strong designer or somebody with a very strong aesthetic sensibility and user experience sensibility in your founding team, go hire that person, right? So I think it's, for me, it's always been that. How do you compliment? So uh, the reverse is also true. When I've looked at joining early stage startups, I always look, is there a vacuum? Is there a place to fill? Right. If I look at the founding team and I say, you know what, you already covered three of the five things that I bring to this table. I'm not really required. If I cover a majority of the things which they lack, then I know that I can go and make a real difference. Right. So that reverse mapping is also true. So, I mean, whether it's a founder mapping that, hey, in my core team, in my first set of people that I'll hire, what are the skill sets I want? It's very dependent on the skill sets you don't have. But Sometimes the mistake people make is product founders, for example, might actually be spending a lot of time fundraising and doing everything else that being a CEO has, uh, you know, entails and might not be able to spend that kind of time on building the product. In that case, go hire a product builder, go hire someone who can do a lot of the zero to one thinking for you. Right. Uh, no, lots of, uh, lots of interesting insights there. Going to the other dimension, hmm. without going into the specifics of each company, but what have you learned from working across domains, right? Whether it was sports and cricket hmm. with Hotstar or QMath or EdTech or healthcare and stuff, Pacto and so forth. Uh, what are, again, things that are transferable in terms of your own learnings, as well as perhaps if I can take the Indian consumer lens, how has the Indian consumer evolved? So even though you've been changing sectors, yes, but the yes. consumer has also been evolving, right? So. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I'll give you a great example of this, right? Like uh, when you're at Pacto, we are trying to build a, a network, a social network for doctors. It was one of the products, uh, projects I worked on in my early days at Pacto. Yeah. And, you know, we had a, we had, we had a classic, you know, like a, like a profile page for doctors. And, you know, we, we already had a lot of information about doctors. So we, we onboarded about, you know, 40, 50 doctors in, in, in this beta that we were running and we had this beautiful profile page. And we realized no doctor was making any edits to this page. So, you know, their name, qualification, age, you know, colleges that they had gone to, etc. And they weren't making changes, even though when obviously there were errors. In fact, in a few places, I introduced errors just to see if the doctor would go change like the name of the college that they had gone to. But doctors weren't. So we called up a doctor and I said, sir, what's happening, right? Like, why are you not going and editing and his question was, how do I edit? And I'm like, that pencil icon is right there next to your name, next to your qualification. 
and in hindi he said mujhe satna aayega ki that is what i have to do to sort of edit this. <laughs> and that is for me that was such a massive wake up call that you know doctors are not on linkedin doctors are not on facebook and this was not a old doctor this was a 40 year old right but the reality and this is this is of course 6 years back 2015 but the fact is that doctors are you know they use their phone they use email effectively and they use uh, you know whatsapp very effectively and there are certain tools of their work uh, you know technology driven tools that they use but like you or i they are not sitting on social media right they are not on twitter they are so building a profile for themselves is not obvious to them and the fact that this deeply ingrained design pattern that a pencil icon means edit right is not clear to them it's not obvious to them right so this was one big learning and i i i i went and sat with my designer who cried tears of sort of blood that you know you're going to make me change it to a label saying click here to add your to edit your name click here to edit your qualification but it worked we had 90% plus conversion on that page in terms of people that you know editing their profile but if i flip that across right so the the evolution though is that now we are in a world where so you know one could say okay you know standard universal design patterns don't work in india that could have been the bad take away from that example but the truth is the indian user is evolving far faster than our product managers and designers are evolving so the fact like one of my favorite examples on share chat is that because people use material created on share chat for sharing they change that three dot button which is the share icon on android to a whatsapp icon because they knew that what people will be using is whatsapp for sharing right now the fact that that is the default way of sharing and that whatsapp is share is so easily understood right but then there is power usage which is happening my mother showed me my mother who's in her 60s showed me that on i used to get a message on whatsapp i would hard press the message then get into reply mode and type a reply and she's like why do you do that you can just swipe right on any message and it automatically goes into reply mode and i had one of those moments where my mind was blown that my mother who is you know she sticks savvy sure but like she knows this design pattern and i don't and i'm the one who actually builds these products right so i think one of the big things that has happened is that the the most popular products in the ecosystem quickly become the lingua franca of design so users understand these design patterns very inherently because of whatsapp because of facebook because of the rise of tiktok back in the day and sort of now with reels and everything else right we data is so cheap in india that video is the default way in which we now sort of consume content right like we skip we skip all other things we skip audio we skip a bunch of things and we directly jump to video and became the largest consumers of video in the world right so with things like this we have to keep pace with our users not the other way around i often earlier used to make this mistake that you know design would be ahead of users and users have to play catch up which is which is just a really bad way of thinking about it because your users should not be playing catch up with you you should be building for your users but now it's the other extreme where i think our users are far ahead of us right are far ahead of the people building in this market so when we say we are building for bharat or you're building for the next 100 million users and i feel like man the people who are building have no idea where the next 100 million people have gone they have gone to a different place they are far ahead they use the kind of products we don't use so their design thinking and design patterns have evolved we have to catch up let me ask you a specific question on that right mm. so if you were doing a practical like thing today which you are in some sense right because you're doing mm. google pay and tomorrow you'll do something else and so mm. forth and you wanted to catch up with the current design lingua franca of where the state of the art is right like building mm. for bharat mm. what is what is a practical way in which you would go and figure that out before you start designing anything saying yeah. let me understand that people understand the share button or people understand the edit button or the pencil long the you know moral equivalent we have to learn from people who have been doing this for the last 80 90 years in india which is everyone who's ever worked in fmcg you know the unilevers of india the itcs of india were very big on user research and market research all right every one of our brethren who work in you know the the big four consulting companies or who have ever worked in in the world of fmcg and i think this is this is very weird uh as you look at mid stage and late stage startups you realize that a lot of the business leadership actually comes from old school companies you know a lot of folks who have worked in hindustan lever etc are uh, or pepsi or coke and things like that are actually leaders 
at larger company. But early stage companies seem to think that we have nothing to learn from old school companies. And to me, that's like a, that's a big fundamental problem because they were very good at market research. They were very good at going and figuring out insights from the users by actually going sitting with their users and, and think the fact that, a, I mean, I, I know shampoo sachet is such a, you know, over abused example of like good product thinking, but it is great product thinking. They realize that you can't sell full shampoo bottles at 25 bucks a pop to people. You have to sell it at one rupee a pop in sachets, right? That's great user insight. What is the equivalent of that user insight in the tech product world, right? So there is no shortcut, but the only way to do this is actually go and, you know, talk to the people who are, who are your potential users or who are your existing users, right? Like go figure out how usage happens. Go figure out why only 20% women are your users. And you'd realize because only 20% of them own their own phones. They still use their brother's phone or their husband's phone during the day or their kid's phone for crying out loud during the day when the kid is away in school. So ownership of phones is restricted to four hours or five hours during the day. I always used to think that uh, say at Hotstar that all our daytime, daytime, sorry, the soap opera daytime watching was not restricted to peak hours because then I realized, sure, the television at home is monopolized by the rest of the family. So why are women or who is watching data? I mean, all these soap operas during the day. And then it became very clear to me that phone usage for women is higher during the day when kids are away at school in India and when husband is away, right? And that's a reality. And you don't get that insight until unless you understand how tier two, tier three markets work, right? That women would have finished all the work at home. And then at 11, 30, 12, and two hours before their kids are going to come back, they're going to sit and like catch up on the previous night's show. And which is why 12 to two was peak time for me, as far as SaaS Bahu shows were concerned in India, right? And See, that insight you only get if you try and understand why is this pattern different? Because if somebody owns their own phone, they should be able to watch it at any time, right? And it should match peak time. But then you realize peak time cricket is going on. Peak time something else is going on, right? So I think this is this is the big gap. I think we need to learn from the old world in a big way, I think, in the startup ecosystem. Uh, there were The principles of market research and user research have not changed, right? They are pretty much the same those theories are still very much relevant. And I think we, we, we just need to put our egos aside and sort of jump in. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, I've kind of read this book again, uh, I think CEO factory at, uh, by yes. somebody who's from uh, in the sun lever, uh, yeah. in the sun lever. Right. And, right. and, uh, and I really enjoyed it because I think a lot of that, so I think it'd be interesting to see people from those backgrounds come in and, and, and be product managers and, you know, product strategists and so on rather than the typical sort of consulting types, right? Uh, coming in and doing that, but um, great. So switching gears, mm. let's talk about, you know, a couple of things I've seen you mention uh, in the past, which is that, you know, the coming of age of product management in India, right? And the maturing and the golden age of product management and so forth. Um, and in particular, I think you were also mentioning that you were surprised as to while that is a great place to be in compared to say 10 years or 15 years ago when we were all getting started in this ecosystem, design has overtaken product, right? Mm -hmm. And design sensibility. So maybe you can sort of elaborate on both, right? The design bit and, and how designers come to age and yet, you know, PM has also come to a nice golden age. Yeah. So, I mean, on the engineering front, I mean, India has been an engineering superpower for a fairly long time. And, you know, it, it started out in the in sort of the services industry, but I think in just pure sort of development and actually being that evolution of working for other people and sort of working to a spec document or a PRD written by other people to engineers actually taking ownership of building things. And what I call a product engineer, right, which is an engineer with phenomenal product sense. And I think we've, we've sort of seen that evolution and I think we are, we are, we are already there, right? We are, we are on that engineering front. I think that maturity has come. It's getting more and more mature, but I think we are already world-class or maybe world-class minus one step there as far as engineering is concerned. But about 10 years back, I used to look at the state of product management and of design and UX. And I always used to feel that I think Indian PMs would over time outpace designers 
because I wasn't seeing world-class design happen in India. I wasn't seeing the quality of our design be, and I, it was of course of a mix of patterns. It wasn't necessarily due to the designers, but essentially I didn't see designers having a seat at the table 10 years back or even seven, eight years back. What's flipped around completely is that our design quality and the output, the quality of our apps, the quality of our web pages, and just sort of the quality of the user flows is, is becoming world-class, is already getting there, right? Uh, and we can see that with the fact that Indian designers are in demand and sort of are getting now hired by international companies. But I think design outpaced, the growth of Indian designers outpaced. I think suddenly like a something went off and I think it's possibly because design can be taught and because design schools suddenly woke up and said, we have to get people ready for the job market that the quality of design, the fact that 22 year olds had portfolios where they had done product deconstructs and they had designed eight different app interfaces. And, you know, there is no 22 year old product management aspirant who has done product deconstructs of 20 products. That just doesn't happen, right? Engineers have their GitHub repositories, designers have Behance and Dribble and everything else, but PMs don't. So, you know, just the fact that people start in product management much later, right, and start developing product sense much later was a factor that I completely missed out in my calculation when I used to think that people, you know, that PMs will outpace designers in India, in the Indian ecosystem. What's happened is designers have outpaced us. Design also has a very clear seat at the table where people have started looking at good design as a moat, as a defensible mechanism against competition, right? That if my product is better designed, then I would win. Uh, but what has been heartening, at least in the last year, year and a half, is that I feel like we are finally entering the, the golden phase, the golden age of product management globally. And I think it's having a very positive impact on PMing in India. One, I think just the PMs were these people you used to hire. You know, we have to get work done. A project manager hire Karlo. And you know, it was like a the PM as a project manager, as somebody who used to get things done and who would run around engineers and designers and get things done. I think that was the take on why people needed a PM. But I think now we sort of, we're looking at PMs becoming founders. We are looking at founders recognizing that they need good PMs pretty early in the, in the life cycle of their product, even in a, at a very early stage. And we are seeing PMs have an inordinate impact on the product and its growth, right? Like, so now that we have, we have these large, uh, you know, products coming out of India, you know, the Zomato Swiggies of the world, the Olas of the world, uh, you know, the hot stars of the world across every domain, we have, large enough products which have massive usage built completely from India, product managed completely from India, designed completely from India. Then I'm finally start starting to see that a little bit of uh, maturity coming on the product side, which was much needed. I think there's still a long way to go. Are we world-class yet? I don't think so. I think we are maybe two steps below or three steps below that. I think design and engineering is still ahead of us, but I think we are entering a really good phase on product management. Fantastic. So uh, I want to kind of go back a little bit to uh, something that I know you recently started, which is offering your own course on product management and <clears throat> would, would love to get your thoughts on, you know, what are some of the sort of key critical skills that one should do, right? If you're not from, if you're not already a product manager, right? And you mm -hmm. sort of want to either get into product management or you are a junior product manager or an associate product manager and you sort of work your way up the ranks. And number one, number two, you know, just this notion of continuous learning, right? Sort of Kaizen, right? How do you do that while you're already working at a job or at a startup, which is worse yet, Got because it. you have like 113 things to do every day. So Got how it. do you keep current? Got so I think my, my, my first course was that, that came out was essentially for existing PMs. And I think the, the gap there that I realized was that so if, if you have two years of PMing experience, uh, now you have a seat at the table, you are a PM at a startup. What next? What do you do now that you are a PM, right? Like, how do you think about your own career? How do you think about upskilling yourself? How do you think about growing, right? And, and that course essentially came out of my own struggles as a PM and the struggles I saw of my entire cohort, right? So the folks who sort of are in the Indian ecosystem, you know, who are product leaders at, at various companies across uh, the Indian tech ecosystem, 
I saw all of them sort of struggle and sort of, you know, through a lot of trials and errors, sort of they, they've reached the places that they have. And, you know, they've all done well for themselves. But the fact is, you know, there was no handholding for, uh, for, for a bunch of us. There was no sort of playbook to follow, literally. And which is why I called it playbook, right? Because like, hey, this is a step-by-step -step guide to like sort of thinking about your career, right? How do you do that sort of grow from a senior PM to a product lead, right? Like, what does it take? To actually do that what does it how do you contribute to your organization how do you contribute to your own success how do you make sure that people who start reporting to you now that you've become a people manager actually succeed so i think that was one aspect i think the other thing that i've, I've started very actively doing is also trying to help people get into product management and break into product management and which is i think where your question is uh which is how do you develop this product sense because there clearly is no curriculum, right? As an engineer, you know, you learn coding at an early stage and early age and you, you know, you start solving problems because there are enough and more well-defined problems in the world. And same is true for design and, you know, design schools have started doing that. At what point in your life do you start thinking about building a product and being a product manager, right? And, and that gap still exists. So, you know, most people actually make that transition into product management while doing something else. A marketeer moves into product management or an engineer moves into product management or a, or a game designer like me moves into product management. Right? But again, there is no path there to follow. There is no clearly laid out like do step A, B and C and then you can sort of become a PM. And I think I'm, I'm spending a lot of time there in helping people understand how do you develop a product sense? How do you think about products, right? And then in your current situation, in whatever you're doing, how do you raise your hand and say, hey, I would like to opt in for this role? Because I still feel that the best place to make that transition is at an existing job where you have credibility as an engineer, where you have credibility as a designer. And then say, you know, at, I'm going to spend 20% of my time doing the PM role or 30% of my time and eventually set yourself a two quarter target and then flip to being a PM, right? I think it's very difficult to do it from moving from one company to the other, right? I, I, I always say that my own transition was more uh you know luck than anything else i got lucky right that i got the right opportunities at the right time it doesn't play out that way for everyone right so i think that those are the things that i've been focusing on right like both for existing pms how to sort of navigate their career and how to think about progress and two of sort of how to help people get into product management and then of course there's a for all of this the big thing is how do you continue to learn right and which is Sure, we learn from the day-to-day -day work. Every time we solve a problem at work and every time you know something fails or something succeeds, we learn from that experience. But I think over and above that, and this is my favorite question to ask people in their interviews, right? I always ask people like, hey, how do you learn? And you know, somebody says, I read a lot of blogs. And I'm like, okay, but that's not really learning. You read a lot, that's good. How are you applying this, right? Because I think one of the things people miss about learning is that until you're, you can consume a lot of stuff and that's good, but until unless you're somehow applying it back and completing this loop, it's not really learning, right? So I think what I've always been looking for and what I've been trying to guide people towards is that, hey, complete your loop. If you have read a great blog post on growth product management, which part of it are you gonna take and apply to your situation and your circumstance? And if you have, show me like a real example of like, hey, I, you know, I did a course on Reforge on sort of growth product management, and then I took this part and applied it here. Or I read this wonderful blog post on how Google Pay solves for the retention and engagement. And then I applied it in my own small healthcare startup, right? And unless this transition happens, and maybe you didn't apply it, but were you able to synthesize all the lessons and write something about it? Were you able to share further? So I think to me, the greatest growth hack on learning is teaching. The reason I teach is a very super selfish reason. Every time I teach, which means I have to be well prepared because people will question me and they will, they, they will hold me accountable for their learning, which means I have to be really good at what I'm teaching and I have to be able to synthesize all that and then process it and then transfer it to people. So for my, this is the classic Feynman method, right? Like where Richard Feynman very famously said, if I can't turn it into a course for freshmen, then I don't know enough about it. And he very famously said that I can't teach quantum electrodynamics to freshmen. And he had just won a Nobel prize in that. And he's like, if I can't teach it to freshmen, that means nobody can, because then that means collectively we don't know enough about this subject, right? 
Yes. So to, yeah. So to me, that is the loop to crack, right? Which is whenever I learn something, I try and teach it. If I can teach it successfully and su the success there is, did other people get it? And then did they go further and apply it in their sort of careers and in their sort of situations? Then I know my, my learning is complete. Absolutely. I think there's this beautiful quote says that uh, when one teaches to learn, obviously the teacher learns and the student learns, right? So <clears throat> it's the same uh, like the Feynman method. And some of us who are not teaching are, are podcasting. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it, it so is, we are, we're learning from smart guys like you. Um, no, it is exactly that, right? I think operators as teachers is, is going to be, I, I'm very bullish on this as a business model, right? Like we had and one could see the difference, even if, you know, if you had gone to engineering school, the profs who were doing industrial consultancy and sponsored research just had a very different take on teaching theoretical subjects than professors who didn't, right? Uh, I mean, speaking as somebody who went to engineering school and did chemical engineering, I can clearly tell you that I could make out the difference between the, the, the profs who were doing a lot of consulting products and used to run companies of their own on the side, oh, just, just phenomenally different in their ability to teach. And I think in, in our work environment, whether it's design, whether it's engineering, whether it's product management, uh, whether it's business, whether it's marketing, I think we are going to see the rise of operators as teachers. And I think that's a business model I'm super bullish on as well. You know, with the whole cohort-based courses, et cetera, rising, I think the operators as teachers is just, just a phenomenal thing which is going to happen. Great learning and teaching opportunity. Wonderful. Hey, uh, Achyubani, great talking to you. Really delighted that you could take some time and spend uh, some time on the Prime Venture Partners podcast. Um, thanks. Thanks again for being on the show. Pleasure. Pleasure being here, Ramit. And thanks for having me. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.